Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here with you and to be able to share my own personal journey from conventional finance to what I call regenerative investing. And my trip started um, about uh, 25 years ago when I was studying finance. And this is a very iconic construct in the financial world. It rests on the premise that all you need to know to make an investment decision is the risk, the return, and the liquidity of an investment. The understanding is the higher the return, the better, the lower the risk, the better, and the higher the liquidity, the better. Liquidity is how fast you can convert it into cash. And that's all you need to know to make an investment decision. This is what I call the narrow lens of conventional finance. And actually, after studying math for six years, this looked like the real world to me. <laughs> but as you know, the real world looks more like this. And in order to understand this tree, you really need to see it as deeply embedded in a dense network of relationships. And I'll just mention a couple of them. It isn't a relationship with our own breathing, right? We breathe the oxygen that we got from the tree, and the tree takes up our CO2. The tree is in a relationship, a mycorrhizal relationship with the fungi in the soil, and it uh, exchanges nutrients with it. And of course, it's in a relationship with the, uh, the birds and the many organisms for which the tree is a habitat. When you see the tree through the lens of finance, this is all you can see. Finance can only see the commodity value of lumber and not the rich relationships of an alive tree. Another way of saying this is that according to the narrow lens of conventional finance, a tree is worth more dead than alive. And it is this very narrow lens that allows for the transformation of a place that looks like this into a place that looks like this. And this is hard to take in. And you can say from an intellectual standpoint, what a waste, right? Whatever economic value was derived from this operation, it could not possibly capture the value of what we lost. Or you can think about the injustice. This was part of the common. It was privatized. It was sold. And very few people benefited from this transformation. And yet, if investors had bought this forest for $10 million and sold the lumber for $12 million, they would have gotten a 20% return if they had completed the operation in a year. But if they completed that operation in six months, they would have gotten a 40% annualized return. And in three months, 80%. Remember what I said at the beginning, the higher the return, the better. And it was exactly a transformation like that that got me to leave the financial industry in 2009. I was working at the time for a very well-respected, uh, ethically and professionally managed investment management firm. I was part of the emerging markets team and we were managing $20 billion, primarily for endowments and foundations. And one of the best performing stocks in the portfolio was a Malaysian palm oil company that had replaced tens of thousands of acres of original rainforest with a monoculture of palm oil plants. Part of the reason why they did so well that year, they got a lot of carbon credits for planting trees. And I remember talking to the chief investment officer of an environmental foundation that had hired us to manage their portfolio. And I said, are you not concerned that the money of your foundation is invested in a company that has just destroyed tens of thousands of acres of the habitat of these guys, which is exactly the mandate of your foundation? Well, there was a little bit of a, an awkward moment there. And then he said, look, my job is to manage the assets of the foundation with the goal of protecting them in perpetuity. Notice a luxury not afforded to the thousand-year-old rainforest. And he said, I need to generate enough to return to pay for the operations of the foundations and for its programs. And at that point, I realized there was something systemically wrong with the financial industry. And I had to walk away from it. That was not easy to leave a very high-paid job in the middle of an economic recession, but I had to do it. 
And then I started studying these large systems, the financial system, the economic system, and the money and banking system, trying to figure out how are they structured so that they provide to otherwise intelligent and well-meaning individuals the incentives to do something that is so damaging and collectively, I believe, self-destructive. And one of the things that came right out of that research is the virtual and ephemeral nature of money, including investment capital. They are all electronic numbers on computers at this point. And I want to give you a sense for that, uh, for how ephemeral they are. The uh, global GDP last, uh, in 2012 was $70 trillion, all the goods and services produced worldwide. The financial markets, just the stock markets and bond markets around the world, were worth $212 trillion, three times as much. And you know very well, a bad news, uh, global bad news can wipe out uh, trillions of dollars of financial markets value within a couple of hours. Where do those trillion dollars go? And how real are they if they can disappear so quickly? And what about the derivatives instruments the financial sector has created, which are estimated right now at $1,200 trillion? These are the CDOs and the credit default swaps that got us in trouble in 2007. How real could this possibly be? I want to be a little bit more specific and talk about the market capitalization of oil companies. And before I do that, I need to introduce you to three very important numbers. The first one is two degrees Celsius. Everybody in Copenhagen in 2009 agreed we cannot let the global temperature of the planet rise beyond two degrees Celsius from the pre-industrial levels. If we do, global ecosystems will, will start to unravel to the point where their ability to support complex forms of lives, that's us guys, <laughs> cannot be taken for granted. And so we know we're raising the temperature by putting CO2 in the atmosphere, a lot of carbon. How much carbon can we put in the atmosphere before we breach that? And that's 500 giga gigatons. At the current emission pattern, it's going to be 13 years from now. But the question is, how much carbon do we have? We already discovered 2,800 gigatons of carbon. We already know and have five times the carbon we can burn. I don't think, as humans, we've wrapped our head around these three numbers. Because if we had, we would stop all explorations for new fossil fuels. And we would stop the most expensive extraction of fossil fuel, like deep ocean drilling and tar sands exploration and, and mountaintop coal removal, right? We would stop that. And yet, the total market capitalization of the six top oil companies is $1,365 billion. I tell you, the market is not getting this right. And most importantly, if you have a well-diversified portfolio or a pension plan, you own these guys. And we can either do two things. We can stop after we take 20% of those assets and leave the other 80% stranded in the ground, in which case the capitalization of the top companies will probably be a tenth or a, you know, a fifth of that. Or we keep going. And so if we keep going, let me ask you the question, how much would the capitalization of the top six oil companies be on a planet that cannot support human life? So if you get one thing out of my talk is this. The investments we make today do not happen in a parallel planet and they just repatriate the financial returns. They're building the world we're living in tomorrow. And this introduces me to the tardigrade, a very uh, oddly cute little creature that can live completely dried up for 10 years. You soak it in the water for 15 minutes and it comes back to life. And also they found tardigrades living at temperatures between minus 50 degrees and plus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm saying this because if you happen to be a tardigrade, <laughs> then... Your investment and retirement portfolio is perfectly positioned to create the conditions in which you will have a comfortable retirement. <laughs> but if you're not a tardigrade, you really need to pay attention to what world your investments are bringing into existence. And yet, I have a confession to make. 
Three years after leaving my finance job, my investments were still invested in the global extractive economy. Until I had a little insight when I was sitting on that cushion and I was doing meta practice. And I was imagining sending loving kindness to all living beings around the world. And then the image of the destroyed forest came to my mind. And I realized my investments were probably creating widespread, if unseen, damage to ecosystems and habitats for living beings and communities around the world. And I had to overcome my fear of losing financial return or financial diversification from my portfolio, and I sold everything and liquidated my entire portfolio. And what I realized is that why was it harder for me to align my livelihood with my values than to do that with my portfolio? And you know what? Losing a very high-paid job was about 100 times more costly than losing financial return on my investments. And I realized that money, especially in the form of investment capital, in this highly intermediated, opaque complex global financial system has the weird power to separate our intentions and values from our agency in the world expressed through our investments. And that's the reality. And so uh, now all my investments follow this moral compass. I start with biophilia, which is the innate law for everything that is alive. And I'm asking myself, is this investment supporting the conditions conducive to life? And if the answer is yes, I actually establish a personal direct relationship with the entrepreneur. And I want to find out, is she also guided by a moral compass? And is the enterprise doing good by preserving the integrity of communities and ecosystems? And only if the answer is yes, I'll proceed and look at the investment. All my investments are now regenerative investments. Now, the good news is that there are four trends that are going to change how we do investing. And the first one is the social enterprise movement. There is a new class, a new generation of entrepreneurs. They are uh, put off by the idea of working for a profit-maximizing corporation operating in the extractive economy. And they, were, they want to use their skills and their talents to, go, to do good to solve an environmental or social problem and use a for-profit model to address those problems. And yes, the social enterprise need to be profitable to be self-supporting, but its goal is no longer profit maximization. The second trend is impact investing. There's a tiny percentage, hopefully growing rapidly, of investors, and I hope that you will join that movement, uh, of investors and owners of capital. They're rec recognizing, finally, the tremendous collateral damage for societies and communities and environment of doing investing through the narrow lens of finance, which is just paying attention to return, risk, and liquidity. And they're starting to integrate social and environmental considerations in their decision-making process. The third trend is a change in the regulatory environment and in the technology. So uh, the Jobs Act is an example of that, 2012, and the, all the crowdfunding platforms being developed will open up the possibility for many more people to do direct investing. And the fourth trend is the local first movement. Buy local, shop local, and so on. And at the intersection of these four trends lies the very crucial possibility of a secular shift in the $30 trillion worth of investment capital in the United States away from the global extractive economy and towards rebuilding local communities, local enterprises, and healthy ecosystems. And in fact, slow money is one of these uh, ideas. Uh, it's the beginning of that secular shift in investing. This was uh, launched by a book called Inquiries into the Nature of Slow Money, Investing as if Food, Farm, and Fertility Mattered. What a novel idea. Um, Woody Tash was the author of that. And communities around the country are 
organizing under the slow money principles. And the first one is we must bring money down to earth. And it starts from an understanding that both our financial system and our food system are fundamentally broken, that they can be fixed from the ground up by investing in real people, in real places, in real enterprises close to home, starting with food. And this is obviously patient investing, uh, has a goal of building healthy enterprises and communities over the long haul, and measuring the success by the world we create, by the fertility of the soil, and not by the profit we make. And so, if you think about that, slow money is also motivated by biophilia. And why on earth would we not pay attention to whether our investments are creating the conditions conducive to life versus degrading them? I mean, we all need to use our money uh, and our investments to express our deep, innate love for everything that is alive. Would you join me in investing as if life mattered?